A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book um, three, The Track of a Storm. Chapter nine, The Game Made. When Sidney Carton and the sheep of the prisons were in the adjoining dark room, speaking so low that not a sound was heard, Mr. Lorry looked at Jerry in considerable doubt and mistrust. That honest tradesman's manner of receiving the look did not inspire confidence. He changed the leg on which he rested as often as he had if he had fifty of those limbs and were trying them all and examined his fingernails with a very questionable closeness of attention. And whenever Mr. Lorry's eye caught his, he was taken with their, that particular kind of short cough requiring the hollow of the hand before it, which is seldom, if ever, known to be a, an infirmity attendant on perfect openness of character. Jerry said, Mr. Lorry, come here. Mr. Cruncher came forward sideways with one of his shoulders in advance of him. What have you been besides a messenger? After some cogitation accompanied with an in intent look at his patron, Mr. Cruncher conceived the luminous idea of replying. Agicut character. My mind misgives me much, said Mr. Lorry, angrily shaking a forefinger at him, that you have used the respectable and great house of Telson's as a blind, and that you have had an unawful occupation of an infamous description. If you have, don't expect me to befriend you when you get back to England. If you have, don't expect me to keep your secret. Telson shall not be imposed upon. I hope, sir, pleaded the, um, uh, the abashed Mr. Cruncher, like a gentleman like yourself, thought I had had the honor of odd jobbing that, till I'm gray at it, would think twice about harming of me. Even if it would so, I don't say it is. And even if it was... And those, and which it is to be ta took into account that if it those, it wouldn't even then. But all of one side, there'd be two sides of it. There might be medical doctors at the present hour, a picking up their guineas where the honest tradesmen don't pick up their his fardens. Fardens. No, nor yet his half-ardens and car carriages, ah, equally like smoke, if not more so. That, well, that would be imposing too on Telsons. For you cannot sarce the goose, sauce the goose, and not the gander. And here's Miss Cruncher, or leastways those in the Old England Times and would be tomorrow, if cause given a flopping again the business to that degree as is ruinating, stark ruinating. Whereas the medical doctor's wives don't flop, catch them at it. Or if they flop, their toppings goes in favor of more patience. And how can you rightly have one without it, without another? Then what with undertakers, and what with parish clerks, and what with sextons, and what with private watchmen, all a varicous, varicous, and all of it, all in it, a man wouldn't get much by it, even if it would so, and what little man, a little a man to get, would never prosper with him, Mister Lorry. He never had no good of it. He want all along to be out of the line if he could see his way out. 
being one sin, even if it would so. Ah, uh, cried Mr. Lorry, rather relenting. Nevertheless, I am shocked at the sight of you. Now, what I would humbly offer to you, sir, pursued Mr. Cruncher, even if it would so, which I don't say it is. Don't prevaricate, said Mr. Lorry. No, I will not, sir, returned Mr. Cruncher, as if nothing were farther from his thoughts or practice, which I don't say it is. Thought I would humbly offer to you, sir, would it would be this. Upon that there st stool at that there bar sets that there boy of mine brought up and growed up to be a man. What will errand you, message, message you, general light job you, till your heels is where your head is. If such should be your wishes, if it would so, which I still don't say it is, for I will not prevaricate to you, sir. Let that there boy, the boy, keep his father's place and take care of his mother. Don't blow upon that boy's father. Don't do it, sir. And let that father go into the line of the regular digging and make amends for what he would have undug. If it would so by digging at them in the wall, in the wheel, and with convictions respecting the future keeping of them sake. That, Mr. Lorry, said Mr. Cruncher, wiping his forehead with his arm as an announcement that he had arrived at the peroration of his discourse. If thought is thought, I would respectfully offer to you, sir. A man don't see all this here going on dreadful round him. In the way of subjects without heads, dear me, plentiful enough fur to bring the price down to porterage and hardly that, without having his serious thoughts of things. And these here would be mine, if it would so, it, entreating of you fur to bear in mind that no, would I said just now. I up and said in the good cause I when I might have keep it back, kept it back. That at least is true, said Mr. Lorry. Say no more now. It may be that I shall yet stand your friend, if you deserve it, and repent your inaction, not in words. I want no more words. Mr. Cruncher knuckled his forehead as Sidney Carton and the spy returned from the dark room. I do, Mr. Bassad, said the former. Our arrangements thus made, you have nothing to fear from me. He sat down in the chair on the hearth over against Mr. Lorry. When they were alone, Mr. Lorry asked him what he had done. Not much, if it should go ill with the prisoner. I have ensured excess to him once. Mr. Lorry's countenance fail. It is all I can do, said Carton, to propose too much, would be to put this man's head under the axe. And as he himself said, nothing worse could happen to him if he were denounced. It was obviously the weakness of the position. There is no help from it. But access to him, said Mr. Lorry. If it should go ill before, the tribunal will not save him. I never said it would. Mr. Lorry's eyes gradually sought the fire from his sympathy with his darling and the heavy disappointment of his second arrest gradually weakened them. He was an old man now, overbore with anxiety and of late, and his tears fail. You are a good man and a true friend, said Carton with an, in an altered voice. Forgive me if I notice that you are affected. I could not see my, my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father. You are free from that misfortune, however. Though he, he said the last words with a set into his usual manner. 
There was a true feeling and respect both in his tone and his touch that Mr. Lorry, who had never seen the better side of him, was wholly unprepared for. He gave him his hand and Carton gently pressed it. To return to poor Darton, said Darnay, said Carton, don't tell her of this interview or this arrangement. It would not enable her to go to see him. She might think it was contrived, in case of the worse, to convey to him the means of anticipating the sentence. Mr. Lorry had not thought of that, and he looked quickly at Carton to see if it were in his mind. It seemed to be he returned to the lock and evidently understood it. She might think a thousand things, Carton said, and any of them would only add to her trouble. Don't speak to me, speak of me to her. As I said to you when I first came, I had better not see her. I can put my hand out to do any little helpful work for her that my hand can find to do without that. You're going to her, I hope. She must be very desolate tonight. I am going now directly. I am glad of that. She has such a strong attachment to you and reliance on you. How does she look? Anxious and unhappy, but very beautiful. Ah. It was a long grieving sound, like a sigh, almost like a sob. It attracted Mr. Lorry's eyes to Carton's face, which was turned to the fire. A light or a shade, the old gentleman could not have said which passed from it as swiftly as the change would sweep over a hillside on the wild, bright day, and he lifted his foot to put back one of the little flaming logs which was tumbling forward. He wore the white riding coat and top boots, then in vogue, and the light of the fire touching their light surface made him look very pale with his long brown hair, all untrimmed, hanging loose about him. His indifference to fire was sufficiently remarkable to elicit a word of remonstrance from Mr. Lorry. His boot was still upon the hot embers of the logging fire when it had broken under the weight of his foot. I forgot it, he said. Mr. Lorry's eyes were again attracted to his face, taking note of the wasted air which clouded the naturally handsome features and having the expression of prisoners' faces fresh in his mind. He was strongly reminded of that expression. And your duties here have drawn to an end, sir, said Carton, turning to him. Yes. As I was telling you last night when Lucy came in so unexpectedly, I have done at length done, I have at length done all that I can do here. I hope to have left them in perfect safety and then to have quitted Paris. I have my leave to pass. I was ready to go. They were both silent. Yours is a long life to look back upon, sir, said Carton wistfully. I am in my seventy seventy eighth year. You have been useful all your life, steadily and constantly occupied, trusted, respected, and looked upon to. Up to. I have been a man of business ever since I have been a man, indeed. I may say that I was a man of business when a boy. See what a place you feel at seventy eight. How many people will miss you when you leave it empty? A solitary old bachelor, answered Mr. Lorry, shaking his head. There is nobody to weep for me. How can you say that? Wouldn't she weep for you? Wouldn't her child? Yes, yes, thank God. I didn't quite mean what I said. It is a thing to thank God for, is it not? Surely, surely. If you can say with truth to your own solitary heart tonight. I have secured to myself the love and a, an attachment, the gratitude of respect of no creature, no human creature. 
I have won myself a tender place in no regard. I have done nothing good of or or serviceable to be remembered by. Your seventy-eight years will be seventy-eight heavy curses, would they not? You say truly, Mr. Carton. I think they would be. Sidney turned his eyes again upon the fire and after the silence of the few moments said, I should like to ask you, does your childhood seem far off? Do the days when you sat at your mother's knees seem days of very long ago? Respecting to his soft manner, Mr. Lorry answered, Twenty years back, at this time of my life, no. For, as I draw closer and closer to the end, I traveled in the circle nearer and nearer to the beginning. It seems to be one of the kind smoothings and preparings of the way. My heart is touched now by many remembrances that had long fallen asleep of my pretty young mother. And I was old. And by many associations of the days when what we call the world was not so real with me. And my faults were not confirmed in me. I understand the feeling, exclaimed Carton with a bright flash flush. And you are the better for it. I hope so. Carton terminated the conversation by rising to help him on with his outer coat. But you, said Mr. Lorry, reverting to a theme, you are young. Yes, said Carton, I am not old, but my young way was never the way of age. Enough of me. And of me, I am sure, said Mr. Lorry. Are you going out? I'll walk with you to her gate. You know my vagabond and restless habits. If I shall prowl along the streets a long time, they'll be easy. I shall reappear in the morning. You go to the court tomorrow. Yes, son, happily. I shall be there, but only as one of the crowd. My spy will find a place for me. Take my arm, sir. Mr. Lorry did say, and they went down the stairs and out in the streets. A few minutes brought them to Mr. Lorry's destination. Carton left him there, but lingered at the little distance, and turned back to the gate again when it was shut and touched it. He had heard of her going to the prison every day. She came out here, he said, looking about him. Turn his this way, must have trod on these stones often. Let me t follow in her steps. It was ten o'clock at night when he stood before the prison of La Force, where she had stood hundreds of times. A little wood sawyer, having closed his shop, was smoking his pipe at the door, at his shop door, excuse me. Good night, citizens, said Sidney Carton, pausing and going by, for the man eyed him inquisitively. Good night, citizen. How is the Republic? How goes the Republic? You mean the guillotine? Not ill. 63 today. We shall mount to the hundred soon. Samson and his men complain sometimes of being exhausted. Ha, ha, ha. He has so drawled that Samson such a barber. Do you often go to see him shave? Always, every day. What a barber. You have seen him at work. Never. Go and see him when he has a good batch. Figure this to yourself, citizen. He shaved the 63 today in less than two pipes. Less than two pipes. Word of honor. As the grinning little man held out the pipe he was smoking to explain how he timed the executioner, Carton was so sensible of a rising desire to strike the life out of him that he turned away. But you are not English, said the wood sawyer, though you wore English, you wear English dress. Yes, said Carton, pausing again and answering over his shoulder. 
You speak like a Frenchman. I am an old student here. Aha, a perfect Frenchman. Good night, Englishman. Good night, citizen. But go and see that droll dog, the little ant, the little, little, the little man persisted, calling after him, and take a pipe with you. Sidney had not gone far out of sight when he stopped in the middle of the street under a glimmering lamp and wrote with his pencil on the scrap of paper, then traversing with the decided step of one who remembered the way well, several dark and dirty streets, much dirtier than usual. For the best public thoroughfares remain uncleansed in those times of terror. He stopped at the chemist's shop, which the owner was closing with his own hands. A small, dim, crooked shop kept in the torturous uphill the rough fare by a small, dim, crooked man, crooked man, giving the citizen two good night as he confronted him at, at his counter. He laid the scrap of paper before him. Woo! The chemist whistled softly as he read it. Hi, hi, hi. Sidney Carton took the heat and the chemist said, For you, citizen? For me. You will be careful to keep them separate, citizen. You know the consequences of mixing them perfectly. Certain small packages were made and given to him. He put them one by one in the breast of his inner coat, counted out the money for them, and deliberately left the shop. There is nothing more to do, said he, glancing upward at the moon, until tomorrow I can't sleep. It was not a reckless manner. The manner in which he said these words aloud uh, uh, under the fast sailing clouds, nor was it more expressive and of negligence than defiance. It was the settled man, manner of the tired man who had wandered and struggled and get lost and got lost, but who at length struck into his road and saw its end. Long ago, when he had been famous among his earliest competitors as a youth of great promise, he had followed his father to the grave. His mother had died years ago, years before. These solemn words, which had been read at his father's grave, arose in his mind, and he went down as he went down the dark streets, among the heavy shadows, with the moon and and the clouds sailing on high about him, above him. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, and though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever say, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. In the cunt, in the city dominated by the axe, alone at night, with natural sorrow rising in him for the sixty-three who had been that day put to death, and for tomorrow's victims then awaited their doom in the prisons and steel of tomorrow's and tomorrow's, the chain of association that brought the words home, like a rusty old ship's anchor from the deep, might have been easily found. He did not seek it, but repeat them, and went on. With a solemn interest in the lighted windows where the people were going to rest, forgetful through a few calm hours of the horrors surrounded them, surrounding them, in the towers of the churches where no prayers were said. For the popular revulsion has e had e even traveled that length of self-destruction from years of priestly impostures, plunderers, and profligates in the distant burial places reserved as they wrote upon the gates for eternal sleep, in the abounding galls, and in the streets along which the sixties rolled to the death which had become a com so common and material that no sorrowful story of a haunting spirit ever arose among the people out of all the working of the guillotine. With a solemn interest in the whole life and deep of the city settling down to its short nightly pause in furry, Sidney Carton crossed the Seine again for the lighter streets. 
few coaches were abroad, for riders and coaches were liable to be suspected, and gentility hid its heads in red nightcaps and put on his heavy shoes and trudged. Trudged. But the theaters were all well filled, and the people poured cheerfully out as he passed, and went chanting home. At one of the theater doors, there was a little girl with a, with a mother, looking for a way across the street through the mud. He carried the child over and before the timid arm was loosed from his neck, asked her for a kiss. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever so leaveth and liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Now that the streets were quiet and the night wore on, the words were the, in the echoes of his feet and were in the air. Perfectly calm and steady, he sometimes repeated them to himself as he walked. But he heard them always. The night wore out, and as he stood upon the bridge listening to the water, as it splashed the river wall walls of the island of Paris, where the picturesque confusion of houses and cathedrals shone bright in the light, in the, uh, light of the moon, the day came coldly, looking like a dead face out of the sky. Then the night with the moons and the stars turned pale and died, and for a little while, while, while it, it seemed, seemed as if creation were discovered, delivered over the death's dominion. But the glorious sun rising seemed to strike those words, that burden of the night, straight and warm to his heart in its long bright rays, and looking along them with reverently shaded eyes. A bridge of light appeared to speak fan the air between him and the sun, while the river sparked, uh, sparkled under it. The strong tides, so swift, so deep and certain, were like a congenial friend in the morning stillness. He walked by the stream far from the houses, and in the light and the warmth of the sun fell asleep on the bank. When he awoke and was afoot again, he lingered there again. He lingered there yet a little longer, watching an eddy through that turned and turned purpose, purposeless until the stream absorbed it and carried it on to the sea like me. A trading boat with a sail of a softened color of a death, dead leaf that glided into his view, floated by him and died away. And its silent track in the water disappeared, the prayer that had broken up out of his heart for a merciful consideration of all his poor blindnesses and errors ended in the words, I am the resurrection and the life. Mr. Lorry was already out when he got back, and it was easy to surmise when the good old man was gone. Sidney Carton drank nothing but a little coffee, ate some bread, and having washed and changed to refresh himself, went out to a place of trial. The court was all astir and a buzz when the black sheep whom may fail, many fail from away from in dread, pressed him into an obscure corner among the crowd. Mr. Lorry was there and Dr. Manette was there. She was there sitting beside her father. When her husband was brought in, she turned and looked a look at him, upon him, so sustaining, so encouraging, so full of admiring love and pitying tenderness, yet so courageous for his sake, that it called the healthy blood into his face, brightened his glance, and animated his heart. If there had been any eyes to notice the influence of her ha look on Sidney Carton, it would have been seen to be the same influence exactly. Before that unjust tribunal, there was little or no order of procedure ensuring to any accused person any reasonable hearing. 
There could have been no such revolution if all laws, forms, and ceremonies had not first been so monstrously abused that the suicidal vengeance of the revolution was to scatter them all to the winds. Every eye was turned to the jury, the same determined patriots and good republicans as yesterday and the day before, and tomorrow and the day after. Eager and prominent among them, one man with a craving face and his fingers perpetually hovering about his lips, whose appearance gave great satisfaction to the spectators, a life-thirsting, cannibal-looking, bloody-minded juryman, the Jacques III of Antoine, the whole jury as the jury of dogs empanel, empanelled to, dry the, to try the deer. Every eye then turned to the five judges and the public prosecutor. No favorable leaning to that in that corner today. A fail, uncompromising, murderous business meeting there. Every eye that then sought some other eye in the crowd and gleamed at it approvingly. And heads nodded at one another before bending forward with a strained attention. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, released yesterday, reaccused and retaken yesterday, indictment delivered, delivered to him last night, suspected and denounced enemy of the Republic, aristocrat, one of the family of tyrants, one of a race proscribed, for that they had used their abolished privileges to the infamous oppression of the people. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, in right of such proscription, absolutely dead in law, to this effect, in as few or fewer words, the public prosecutor, the president asked, was the accused openly denounced or secret, secretly, openly president by whom? Three voices. Ernest Defarge, wine vendor of San Antoine, good. Therese Defarge, his wife, good. Alexander Minette, physician. A great uproar took place in the court, and in the midst of it, Dr. Minette was seen pale and trembling, standing where he had been seated. President, I indignantly protest to you that this is a forgery, for, forgery and a fraud. You know the accused to be the husband of my daughter. My daughter and those dear to her are fair dearer to me than my life. Who and where is the false conspirator who says I, that I denounce the husband of my child? Citizen Bennett, be tranquil. To fail in submission to the authority of the tribunal who been who be, would be to put yourself out of law. As to what is dearer to you than life, nothing can be so dear to a good citizen as the Republic. Loud acclamations hailed this rebuke. The president rang his bell and with warmth resumed. If the republic should demand of you the sacrifice of your, of your child herself, you would have no duty but to sacrifice her. Listen to what is to follow. In the meanwhile, be silent. Frantic acclamations were again raised. Dr. Manette sat down with his eyes looking around and his lips trembling. His daughter drew closer to him. The craving man on the jury rubbed his hands together and restored the usual hand to his mouth. Defarge was produced. When the court was quiet enough to admit of his being heard and rapidly expounded the story of the imprisonment and of his having been a mere boy in the doctor's service, and of the release and of the state of the prisoner when released and delivered to him. The short examination followed for the court was quick with its, with its work. You did good service at the taking of the, of the, at the Bastille, citizen. I believe so. Here an excited woman screeched from the crowd. You were one of the best patriots there. Why not say so? You were a cannoneer that day there, and you were among the first to enter the accursed fortress when it fell. 
patriots, I speak the truth. It was the vengeance who admits the warm commendations of the audience, thus assisted the proceedings. The president rang his bell, but the vengeance warming with encouragement shrieked, I defy that bell, wherein she was likewise much commended. Inform the tribunal of what you did that day within the Bastille citizen. I knew, said Defarge, looking down at his wife, whom stood at the bottom of the steps on which he was raised, looking steadily up at him. I know that this prisoner of whom I'm, I speak has been confined in the cell known as 105 North Tower. I knew it from himself. He knew himself by no other name than 105 North Tower. When he made shoes under my care, as I served my gun that day, I resolved when the place shall fall to examine the cell. It fails. It falls. I mount to the cell with a fellow citizen who is one of the jury directed by the gaoler. I examined it very closely. In the hole of, in the chimney where a stone has been worked out and replaced, I find a written paper that it, this is that written paper. I have made it my business to examine some specimens of the writing of Dr. Manette. This is the writing of Dr. Manette. I confide this paper in the writing of Dr. Manette to the hands of the president. Let it be read. In the dead silence and stillness, the prisoner under trial looking lovingly at his wife, his wife only looking from him to look with solitude at her father, Dr. Manette keeping his eyes fixed on the reader, Madame Defarge never taking hers from the prisoner, Defarge never taking his from his feasting wife, and all the other eyes there intent upon the doctor. Who, who saw none of them, the paper was read as follows.